I want to begin with an assertion, and that's that mankind is a civilization. However, as you're no doubt aware, mankind is a deeply flawed and broken civilization in a lot of ways. We share a single world and we came from a single person in a single place, but due to millennia of dispersal, dispersal and diversification and separate evolution, we evolved into a civilization that is deeply cracked and misshapen from what it originally could have been. Now as we stare at each other in paranoia, the wealthiest 1% of us control a disproportionate amount of the globe in order to maintain the status quo. Those same wealthy individuals use the tiered and separated economies of our civilization to hide and file away their fortunes while they can gain all the fruits of a developed society but avoid actually having to pay for it. A study conducted in 2012 by economist James Henry concluded that at least 21 trillion dollars are hidden away worldwide where they cannot be fairly taxed. This is greater than the GDPs of the United States and Japan combined. In Australia, the top third of companies pay less than 10% tax. Despite what is meant to be a 30% tax rate, those companies do not pay anywhere near that amount in their actual real taxes. This should be illegal, it should be impossible, but due to legal technicalities and taxation technicalities and loopholes, it's entirely possible for them to be able to get away with it within the current system. Moreover, particularly large companies such as Apple are taxed 0.71% on their $27 billion profit within the Australian market. The only way these kinds of massive evasions can take place is due to the enormously complicated web of connections between economies and legal loopholes and, and particular exchange laws and all these kinds of holding groups and they form an elaborate web that's so complicated that they can get away with 0.71% tax. That is financial magic, but it's absolutely destructive towards the economies it's meant to function in. The nature of the civilization of mankind and its cracked and misshapen nature is that it's created cracked and misshapen economies that are vastly different from each other. Some have a great deal of wealth and some have very little. By keeping these economies separate, we reinforce the social and cultural divisions that exist. Companies and individuals can create a product in a weak economy where they can get away with paying for the facilities and for the labor at extremely low rates because the people there don't expect any better and their laws don't provide for anything more, such as Apple creating their products in China. And then those same companies can bring them to the West where they sell them at incredibly high rates because the people there don't expect any cheaper. And that's how they're able to make the most of this enormously diversified market by taking away all the jobs in the rich market and putting it in the poor market and just selling to the people with their incomes. Although now that there's less jobs, those incomes become harder to come by and you get this kind of drained economic destruction. The system has an enormous wealth vacuum and as long as these national divisions exist with their own economies, wealthy businessmen are going to hold those divisions as far apart as possible because the bigger those divisions are, the bigger their profit margins are. The closer that every country comes together, the smaller their profit margins become in terms of this global marketplace that they're exploiting for all it's worth. Disparity between these countries is the best possible situation for wealthy businesses because they can use their enormous power and influence through the wealth that they have and their position within rich economies as well to really get whatever they want, to be able to enforce these enormously exploitative rules on the poorer economies and make sure things don't get better and also make sure that prices keep going up and up and up for the sake of themselves and their shareholders in the rich economy. And they can accomplish all this while getting taxed barely anything in that wealthier economy. This is by exploiting that enormously complicated web that was previously mentioned. Apple is another good example for this as in Europe as well as Australia, they've gotten in trouble many, many times for using enormously complicated webs of international finance to make sure that they get taxed a scant percentage, a fraction of a percentage on what they really should be getting taxed. And this is the kind of system that we're working to maintain. 
one that destroys itself and holds itself in a position where no one except the company itself is winning. So for the company itself, it's fantastic. This is the perfect situation for a wealthy company to find itself in. For the development of the human race and our economies and our general infrastructure development and almost every conceivable measure, it's akin to shooting ourselves in the foot at the beginning of a race. We are sabotaging ourselves, but we are told it's for our own benefit. Politicians, no matter how noble they are when they begin, are caught in this system themselves. We blame inactive government, lazy legislatures, whatever it is at the time, but the fact of the matter is, no matter how fiery, no matter how passionate they are, they are still caught in the same nationalistic world with the same beholden obligations to these wealthy companies. If they push them too hard, they're going to leave that economy altogether and set up shop somewhere else. It is enormously better from their perspective to have a, comp a company that is poorly taxed but within their economy than outside of it where they don't get anything from it at all. Not only that, but most politicians are beholden to the party line. So there are established parties. So in Australia, it's the Liberals and the La Liberals and Labour. In America, it's the Republicans and the Democrats. In the UK, they've got three parties, but you you have the same dimensions. These parties are controlled by people that have quite a lot of money, and they have their own agendas usually. And really, in most of these parties, and Palmer United in Australia is going to be no exception at all, as we have seen. And these parties control everything within them. So the only way to get anywhere in politics is to be a part of one of those parties because they control everything. But if you're in one of those parties, you have to toe the party line. So if I come into politics with my completely own ideas, they have to suit one of the parties. Otherwise, I am going to get nowhere because you cannot get anywhere in politics nowadays without a party. And that is a huge, huge disadvantage for the uh, purity of the democratic process to people have to toe the line of a party when you could essentially have all the parties be hopelessly corrupt, all the parties could be completely useless. And at the same time, no one has a choice. The people coming into politics have to toe the line. The public have to vote for one of these parties that the politicians are having to toe the line of. It's just, it's a terrible situation. And not only are the parties locked in, not only are the politicians locked into it, but we are as well as voters. The people that control them are the people that pull the purse strings. And that's the party leadership itself. And the party leadership might not be who you voted for, it's, the peop it's just the people that own the party itself. They're not elected by the general populace. These same people are usually forced to push down movements against climate change, for instance, because there's an extremely powerful industrial and commercial lobby that says, no, we don't want that because it's going to ruin our profits, which again is much the same of everything that drives the nationalistic system. Climate change itself is a really difficult thing to, ta to tackle in a nationalistic system because embracing a model of climate change almost inevitably is going to somewhat hamper your economy at least for a while while you adjust to new ways of doing things and your industries are forced to adapt and develop new technologies. During this process, you're going to be performing slightly worse than people who haven't adopted this. So there is enormous incentive for politicians and people who are beholden to people who want to make money to say no and to put it off and to put it off until later. No country wants to be the only country on the block doing it, so to speak. They need to make sure that everyone is going to do it at the same time, so no country is disadvantaged. In fact, there's almost an advantage in saying everyone else, institute a climate change policy, ruin your economies temporarily, not ruin, but hamper them temporarily, while we don't, because that's essentially what the Liberal government really wanted to do, was to say, look, we don't contribute that much, we don't really want to have to do our part, let's just blame China and the US. So they could keep performing at full efficiency while they got knocked down. 
and you have this kind of nationalistic logic where it's like, well, let's screw the planet, that's fine. And it's so destructive just because they can't handle the idea of falling behind for a bit or they're worried that they're gonna fall behind for a bit economically. And this whole nationalistic lobby that's usually so invested primarily in the right-wing parties is empowered by an enormous media machine. In the US, you know, it's Fox News primarily. In Australia, we have all the Murdoch papers and everything associated with that. There is a wildly disproportionate amount of sway in the Australian media in the hands of right-wing parties. And that's all to do with the Murdoch papers and the Murdoch media machine, News Corp. And what they do is they play up non-critical issues and make them critical. They play up threats. They play up anything that is going to get your mind. So sport, television, whatever it is. Anything that is going to get your mind off the genuine problems such as climate change, such as tax evasion, such as the fact that we are still going to war with each other in the 21st century of the human race. Well, 21st century since zero, so 50,000 years or whatever it is. And that is completely insane, but that is how they maintain themselves. That is how right-wing governments maintain themselves in this modern era, is by having an extremely well-funded media machine that keeps the attention on other topics so they can keep doing what they want to do and keep sneaking things through legislatures and through parliament, pushing through rules, whatever they need to do, budget emergencies, all these kinds of things, so they can get what they want to happen to happen and keep us thinking about something else. And that's how they maintain themselves despite the horrendous decisions that they're often making. The other problem with this lobby that exists, this general industrial right-wing pro-nationalist lobby, is that it's usually very connected to wealth. As I have keep, kept saying, everything comes back to money. Everything comes back to money. I can't reiterate that enough and that is part of the reason why science gets such a beating in the modern economies that we're in is because they want to maintain a status quo they're all based on industries that are currently powerful that's why they're wealthy they don't want things to change Murdoch wants to destroy the advanced internet coverage that we were getting so that it wouldn't threaten Foxtel these kinds of things that happen and they happen across the board. They get cuts to CSIRO and across science in general and development. They only want science to come from commercial interests. And the commercial interests are going to be the wealthiest companies that are creating research projects and concept projects that are going to keep them in power. Everything is about keeping those currently rich people wealthy and in power. This also kind of goes hand in hand with the secular lobby. Um, the really wealthy groups are extremely tied in with old demographics and old conservative demographics, demographics of that. Wealthy people that have brought their riches over from Europe or wherever it is that they've come from and they're very conservative and conservative usually means non-secular, means Christian. And when you have these Christian laws coming in, you have insane policies, like the Abbott government's idea of getting rid of the secular councillors and bringing in religious councillors only under the federal government programs. That is extraordinarily non-secular and it's extraordinarily terrible to do in a modern government. But this is the kind of thing that you have happen in a right-wing government, in a nationalist government that's connected to old wealth and old money and old people. Mankind is split. It is pulled apart by monopolies and oligopolies that have no interest in bringing mankind together onto a single plane. One united system would mean no more tax evasion, no more wars, no more split economies, and no more of this fear-mongering insanity that we get in the modern world. 
Moreover, taxation and law would be uniform. We would be able to actually effectively implement law against transnational bodies, transnational groups, people, whatever it is. These extraordinarily wealthy groups that operate above the national level where they can just jump between countries, whatever is most convenient for them at the time. And would be able to finally actually control that and make no matter how rich you are, no matter how wealthy you are, you can't escape the law. You can't escape that you have responsibilities. You can't just exploit people in whatever country you want and get away with it. You will be punished for crimes. You will be held by the legal system. And this is what you can achieve if you create a united system. And until you do, the extraordinarily rich are just going to change countries, are just going to pressure their own country into letting them do what they want, because otherwise they will change countries. They'll put their money somewhere else. They'll break their whole company somewhere else. Everything is down to money. And as long as they have it, they have a weapon that nobody can challenge in a non-uniform system. It may seem misleading to call mankind a civilization. It may seem that. Not when we think about it usually in terms of the Western European civilization. So you have, you know, France, the UK, Spain, and uh, Prussia. This sort of grouping of the Germanic civilization. See, so then you have Central Europe, which is basically Poland and uh, the Czech Republic and... Austria, though that's more part of the West, uh, Bulgaria, these sorts of places, and you move into the East, you have an East European one, you have a North African one, you have a Middle Eastern one, you have a Chinese civilization, but really it's just a matter of focus. I mean, we're just deciding what level we're going to say is a civilization, because really, the, I mean, France is a civilization within the Western European one. It, we only see Western Europe as a civilization because we're used to thinking on a global level. And on a global level, Western Europe is, you know, it's a group. That is a group unto itself, and that makes sense when you look at all the other groups around the planet. But if we zoom into Western Europe, and suddenly that's our entire frame of reference, we go, okay, we can't say Western Europe anymore because our brains tell us we have to divide everything. So now we definitely have France and we definitely have Spain and we definitely have the UK and we definitely have Ireland and Scotland and Wales and uh, Belgium and the Netherlands. And um, if you want to throw it in, we have Luxembourg as well. And we say that is a grouping. So, okay, now we've got all those groups. But then we look at France and we say, okay, but, you know, then we look further back in history within France and we see that the Norman civilization is very separate to the civilization that developed around the south, which is Marseille. And, you know, you have the sort of the more Gallic regions in the middle and down towards the bottom. And we sort of see that that then splits up. And then I'm sure we focus in on Normandy and we'll probably start splitting that up because ages before that, you know, they developed very separately. It's almost all about time. So the further back you go, you're going to find smaller and smaller subdivisions because communication meant that they couldn't talk any further than a certain radius, like beyond towns, beyond little areas or the valley or whatever it is. And then as communications developed over time, the civilizations grew to encompass more and more sections. And now in the modern world, almost the entirety of Europe is a civilization because of the EU. And it's, you know, you could argue with that, but again, the only way you could argue with that is by jumping into history and saying, you know, back at this point, it wasn't, or back at that point, it wasn't. And if you're going to take that line, you could almost go infinitely back and call nothing a civilization, you know? You know, some, every town is its own civilization and nothing bigger than that is a real civilization. You know, it's all about how far back you go. And if that's the only way you're defining it, it's completely arbitrary and ridiculous and stupid. So we have the EU, which is basically a civilization. We have China, which is a civilization. We have the Middle East, which is a civilization. But you know, as globalization keeps happening and we're able to talk to literally anyone on the planet, 
we more and more are fulfilling this idea of mankind being a civilization that you know we can engage in business deals with anyone on the planet there's still barriers like you know there's still language barriers there's still the nationalist system itself which sort of keeps things at a certain level but more and more we're joining this general mankind civilization and it's becoming very very real and the thing is if i can jump all the way back in the past and say you know none of these civilizations count like australia for instance i'm gonna say the civilization of the melbourne colony is separate to all the other ones it's a little more arbitrary because they happened all the same time and intentionally but it was run differently melbourne wasn't actually one of the penal colonies um, Sydney was, Brisbane was, Tasmania absolutely was, Van Diemen's Land, but Melbourne itself wasn't really. And you could say that's a different civilization, but, you know, we're Australia now. And we're always going to be, we're never going to think of ourselves like that. And so in the future, I can see it coming, globalization is basically going to turn mankind into a civilization, and it's already largely there. Even then, really, if you think about it on a solar system level, so, you know, if it's valid to talk about it on a Norman scale, or a, or a um, Anglican scale, or a Manchu scale, or whatever you're looking at in detail, and it's valid to look at it on a country level, it's valid to look at it on a planetary level, why not think about it on a solar system level? Why not think about it on a Milky Way level? Each of those levels is just as valid as everything else. We're just talking about our frame of reference. And so if we look at the solar system and we look at Earth and we say, that's the civilization of mankind. You look at how different every other planet is in the, in the solar system with the complete absence of civilizations. If an alien came into our solar system and saw all the planets, they would say, oh, hey, there's a species called human. They wouldn't say, hey, there's France, hey, there's England. It's just, hey, there's the human civilization. You understand what I mean? We are a civilization. We keep pretending we're not, but the more and more we globalize and the more we spread out and the more we become uniform with every year that goes by as we connect more and more, the more the idea that we're not a civilization becomes absolutely ridiculous. See, it's our obsession with creating these mid-level identities. We don't like dealing in absolutes. We don't like saying that everything is the same as us. We like to triangulate our identities against other points. So, say you lived in a village, right? In this village, there was one guy who was pretty much the same as you. Right? Like, there's a few differences, but, you know, more or less, you're pretty similar in terms of what you like, what you think, all that sort of stuff. This guy could either be your greatest enemy or your best friend. And that is insane. But, imagine all other... See, this is ten people in this village. It's a ridiculously tiny village. It shouldn't exist, but let's go with it. The other eight people, right, are enormously different. Like, they are just, like, you can't understand them. They don't speak your language. They don't do anything that you do. They don't anything. They're completely different to you. Suddenly, that guy is your best friend. He's the only guy you kind of get. And you guys are, like, thick as thieves. You guys are, you guys are best mates. And everyone, you're against the world, you know? You would feel so close to that guy. Now, imagine the other eight people are now just like you. They think, you know, 99% the same things that you think and feel. And that guy thinks 90%. Suddenly, he's the weirdo in the town. He's the outcast. And he's the one you want to have nothing to do with while you hang out with the other eight people who you're then going to judge on that, like, half a percent, maybe, that they're all similar to you. And that is completely insane. This person that could be your worst enemy or your best friend changes purely depending on who else is around you. And that's exactly how we see the world. See, you have these civilizations going way back and, you know, like, uh, you know, people in England would say, you know, that other town is full of assholes. They're all idiots. They're all, you know, they're all just completely stupid. 
And then you take it a hundred years later when they're dealing with the French, suddenly the people from that town are completely fine. They're English, they're perfect. There's nothing wrong with them. Now the French are everything that's bad. And so the English experience grows as you add countries and then suddenly, you know, they go imperial and like they still, well, they, they kept hating the French because they just created a grudge and then you kind of break this entire experiment. But you basically have this situation where we hate people based on what's near us. And really the thing with the French, you know, it became pretty much a rivalry instead, but now they, like, they're best friends in the modern world. In the modern world as like part of the EU, the UK and France are basically best friends because they're dealing with Islamic terrorism and whatever else that they're thinking of at the time, or the Russians or whatever, and they've become absolute best friends. The Americans fought off British oppression <laughs> because that was what the most different thing in their world was and then all of a sudden everyone's getting along much better because all the systems have sort of adjusted but it's because they had people like the Japanese and the Nazis to deal with instead. In a system where you have entirely separate economies and entirely separate political systems that have armies and agencies and departments and ministries and, and propaganda and everything else in these situations where you have these entities that look at each other from over the border and have all these guns and all this organization and they're not allowed into each other's systems like two locked houses the only thing that really holds them from attacking each other out of fear or anything else is ethics right like when you have all the weapons and there is no international body that actually stops anything from happening the only thing that stops them from doing it is the ethical realization that they really shouldn't. But ethics don't hold up that well when you add a gratuitous amount of fear into the situation. Almost all of the major military actions throughout, you know, the modern history is because of like anger or fear or something where they thought that they were being treated unfairly or that they were going to be destroyed or something was going on and these people look at each other's systems and their armies and everything else and they get afraid, deathly afraid and they do things that are extremely violent and extremely crazy like a cornered animal and this is the kind of situation you're going to keep having where ethics is the only stop it's the only control on these people who are terrified half the time or furious or whatever it is in a unified system you don't have to rely on ethics because these groups don't have armies. They don't have their own economies. They don't have their own businessmen that are prompting up a war because they're going to make money from it or whatever the hell it is. Their own nationalistic elements that have, you know, their own legislatures and everything. They're not going to have these tight concrete systems that are going to compete with other tight concrete systems. In an international system, the worst thing you're going to have is a big group of people that hate another big group of people. And these two groups of people are going to be violent towards one another and they're going to attack each other. They might do it in huge numbers, but they're not going to have tanks and jets and nukes. They're not going to have agencies. They're not going to have propaganda ministries. They're not going to have all the things that make these organized conflicts so incredibly devastating. They're going to have just people. They're just going to have people who are angry at each other with much better arms control where they can't run around with automatic weapons and shoot each other at either, let alone not have planes and nukes and whatever else that they would have in the modern world instead. It's a common fear that global government would equate to global oppression. However, historically, when states and leaders and groups of people go to war and do horrendous things or implement enormous amounts of control on their own people. They do it through the spectre or the very real threat of an outside party, of a nation that is organizing to come and get them and they have to do something extraordinary to stop them. That is how these things get pushed through. Whether it's legitimate or it's not, they 
always have to use the threat of a big foreign power in order to push onto their people in the way that they do. I mean, one of the most, you know, one of the best examples is people like Joseph Stalin, who was one of the most bloody, vicious murderers in history of his own people. But he did it because he was absolutely paranoid. He was insane, but he was paranoid. So paranoid that the West was infiltrating his government and that everyone was planning to turn against him because these other foreign powers were getting their fingers into his country when really they weren't. But that is why he was so paranoid and so vicious to his own people was that fear of these outside countries coming in. Nazi Germany only existed because the German people felt that they were enormous victims of the World War I Versailles Treaty. When Franz Ferdinand was assassinated, it unlocked this huge sequence of events that happened to end up with all the major nations going to war with each other. Really, everyone was just as much at fault for that as everyone else, but because Germany lost, Germany got all the blame and Germany was made to pay for everyone else's trouble, even though they were as much to blame as everybody else. The Nazi party, so Hitler and his friends, <laughs> effectively played up this insult to Germany, this feeling that they were being victimized for something that they weren't entirely responsible for, and they turned it into Nazi Germany. That is how they did it was because other countries were treating them horrendously and unfairly. And so they decided that they would get back at them for it. There's this constant national interplay that creates all the world's worst crimes. Ethnic cleansing and genocide in the developing world or Eastern Europe is the product of tremendously low levels of education and huge levels of poverty. These people that are just desperate, traditional beyond belief and very, very poorly educated are just blaming everything that's wrong with the country, wrong with the area, wrong with everything on immigrants or another ethnic group. Even though economically and logically it makes no sense, that's what the conclusion is that they come to and then you have genocides and ethnic cleansing. <clears throat> It's when people are able to dehumanize the other, the other person, and make them not a person anymore, that they're able to perpetrate such vicious acts of violence upon them. And by getting rid of the nationalistic system that does so much to make that such an easy leap for people to make, we're able to take a huge weapon out of the hands of the forces of violence, of oppression, of destruction, and things that are going to tear apart the civilization of mankind. If you want to live in a world where violence is common, you need to create a world where fear is common as well. The nationalistic system has the greatest level of fear as every system is constantly jockeying and fighting for its ability to exist at the hands of other states that have their own armies and weapons and spies and agencies and economies and businesses and everything that is very subtly or sometimes not trying to tear you to pieces to make them stronger. Presently, the civilization of mankind is not that different to the civilization or the country of East Germany under the Stasi. Everybody wants to trust everyone else. Everyone would love to be able to, but no one can. Everybody is so suspicious that everyone else is lying to them or someone is keeping something from them in order to harm them or get one up over on them that spies and distrust and everything else has become a fact of life in the international arena. Our people our people have turned on themselves all over the world in order to maintain these created nations that we all stand a part of. The world is held in this disarray by the wealthy and the powerful that gain so much, so much from this continuing disparity between these nations. 
We are hamstrung by our ability to efficiently develop together by these divisions between us. Our utility, our productivity, our brain power goes so much towards beating other countries, towards getting one up on everybody else, that we aren't able to focus on actual objective truths, things about the universe, things about developing ourselves philosophically, scientifically, whatever it is. We aren't able to focus on these things because so much human endeavor goes towards beating other humans. It's extremely unlikely that you would have a United States of America if there was no British Empire to threaten it. But does that make the United States a bad idea? If you'd never have a Britain, would you not create the United States anyway? Wasn't the United States a fantastic idea given the situation that the world was in at the time? Many nations now celebrated are the product of a defensive mindset. The United Kingdom against the continental European powers, China against the Xiongnu, the Manchu, and the Tibetans, for instance, in their ancient past, and even the EU, which is largely a follow-on of the NATO alliance against the Russians in the Cold War. Does the fact that these things were created in such specific circumstances make them bad ideas? Can't we unite these countries without there being a threat? Doesn't that still get us the same advantage in the end? If an alien appeared in orbit, an alien battleship or something like that appeared in orbit, would we then suddenly realize the merits of uniting as a civilization? Would we brush all these silly issues that we focus on so much under the rug and unite against that threat? We probably would, depending on the situation, I suppose, but we probably would. And then when it was gone or we were gone, but let's say it was gone because that's the end of the story if we're gone, if the aliens were then gone because we fought them off or they left or whatever it is, would we break up again because we have no frame of reference anymore? No matter how great the united mankind civilization was, would we just break up again because we no longer have a frame of reference or would we hold together because there was an alien and there might be more aliens? The civilization of mankind would be benefited enormously from that unification. It's just down to whether or not we can adjust our perceptions of identity to allow us to do it. Our world needs a new system. Not a complete departure, such as in the Marxist communist vein, that would separate us almost entirely from everything we understand about states in general, and create a world where there is no state at all, and everyone essentially works for what they think is the right amount of time, but there's no overall legal structure and these kinds of things. I don't think that's sustainable at all. And I think it's been largely proven that the process by which you have to get from here to there simply leads to one party rule and tyranny. So we can't really go down that route. Not only that, but as we can see in all the instances have been tried, such as Cambodia, Vietnam, China, Soviet Union, North Korea, it leads to a loss of innovation and a loss of the incentive for people to grow and do more than they have been because there's no real reward for them to do so. And it does also have the effect of encouraging a much stronger black market and criminal side because there is no other way for people to get more than what they're allotted and people always want more than what they're allotted. Anarchism is almost very similar to what the final product of communism is meant to be, except there is money and people effectively create these non-governmental voluntary associations that then, you know, deal with each other. But that's largely been tried in Africa as well, in a lot of countries such as the Congo and Liberia, and it more often than not tends to end up with one group bullying the other ones and killing them because there's no actual authority to say that you can't. And when one group starts to do that, they have a bit of a French Revolution moment where they realize the power of the mob and what happens when no one's around to stop them and they go on a bit of a killing rampage and do effectively whatever they want and create their own government, except with no accountability. Neoliberalism and capitalist free market states lead to irrational policy making enormously exploitative laws, 
and clientelism and the always extraordinarily unhealthy monopolization of markets. There is always a force that doesn't want to be in a free market within a free market. It wants to own everything itself and have absolute control so it can rest on its laurels and not have to worry anymore. And that force is always going to be there. And as long as the state is not powerful enough to hold these con companies from being able to do these sorts of things, they will achieve it and they will create monopolies and oligopolies. I mean, you can see it in the United States, and it's probably one of the worst examples, where they've flown into multiple financial crises, but very rarely are the perpetrators ever actually punished in any real way. There are small fines, sometimes large fines, but very rarely does anyone actually go to jail for the damage they've caused to the economy in the country. This model also leads to excessive privatization, which destroys the effectiveness of many services and, and entities and institutions because the KPIs and the focuses and everything within that organization becomes about income rather than service delivery. You'd think the two are combined, but there's a lot of ways that companies can get around a lot of their obligations and skimp very much on many of them to the point where a service becomes extraordinarily unproductive and extraordinarily costly for people to keep it running because they're trying to create as much wealth as they can and do as little actual work as they can because that's how they're measured that's how they're judged neoliberalism is generally about making very short-term gains but essentially paying for it in the future instead now this isn't to say that it isn't in a class of its own next to the other two options I described, which there are probably other options, but I'm talking about a nuanced option of neoliberalism here and free markets because it itself is extremely bad and it leads to extraordinarily, extraordinary amounts of corruption and extraordinary amounts of exploitation, a free market with no inhibitors on it at all. You need a regulated economy to be able to make something like free market capitalism work. You see, you have the most successful countries in the world in terms of standard of living. So you have, you have Australia, you have the Scandinavian states like Sweden, Norway, and Denmark, and places like this. And they have free markets, but they're extremely regulated. They're controlled to make sure that abuses aren't taking place. America does not have this so much, so it has a lot more issues with this kind of problem. But that's the best system to use because of everything we've devised so far, free market capitalism is the most efficient in terms of filling economic gaps and creating new services and creating new products and everything else. Obviously there's always wastefulness, but it's the best system of those available that we've already thought of in terms of filling those market gaps, pushing forward efficiency and everything else. But you can't unregulate it, you can't take away regulation because then you end up with a system that destroys itself in the name of profits. Neoliberalism and free market capitalism, all of these things, all these situations and, and models, they're like a rocket engine. You can get to the moon with them further than anything else that's available. But you need to keep a very tight rein on it because it could just as easily destroy half a city. And believe me, if you take your eyes off it for even an instant, someone extremely wealthy is going to find a reason to do just that. So what do we want? We want to be able to address climate change effectively. That would require the removal of the economic concerns that countries and governments have to avoid being the only one doing it because that stands in the way of governments and companies committing themselves to these kinds of programs. And so in conclusion, Earth requires a single global government in order to make that happen, because any other system is going to involve the required agreement of countless numbers of participants to come together on the same page at the same time. We want to significantly reduce the amount of power and influence that the extraordinarily wealthy have. While the wealthy will always be able to pay for the ears of the powerful, 
We can create a system where they cannot avoid the enormous amount of tax that they do. And we, cannot, and we can make a system where they can't get away with simply pressuring governments in order to get what they want because the governments fear what they might do if they don't do it. And that will create a huge restriction on the amount of power that the wealthy have in any system because there is only one system. Further than that, if we create powerful, constitutionally mandated and guaranteed institutions whose mission it is to curtail that same private wealth corruption that has such a horrendous effect on the government and the people within those states, we can create a situation between those two major points where we can have wealth, we can have power, we can have innovation, we can have the benefits of a free market system, but also we can lose the excesses, lose the corruption, and lose the dangerous aspects that it creates. Further, by having that single legal system, we can create a system that doesn't allow for loopholes where people jump between systems and that will give us an enormous amount of power to create fair laws for everybody. We want to end the era of suspicion, fear and paranoia that's so associated with governments, armies and agencies. We want to end war that destroys so much of our human potential, both cold and hot wars that do so equally. This requires the loss of the formal and official entities that surround identity groups and turn them into militarized blocks. Diversity is an important part of being human and we would absolutely not want a world where diversity were to disappear. However, we don't want to reinforce that diversity with militaries and governments and official barriers because then those diverse groups see each other as alien and then they see them as non-human and then they can kill them and torture them and blow them up and burn them and do whatever they want to do because they don't think they're human anymore on some level. The civilization of mankind needs one official border and one official barrier and army and institution and everything that can guard the whole, while we as individuals and cultural groups can continue to be exactly who we are and do exactly what we want, but without the armies to reinforce us in doing so. And in doing that, we will learn a whole new level of understanding and empathy for these other people that inhabit this world that we share. We want a world of secular scientific progress. Any modern state should be secular. Religious practices are completely fine. However, they should not affect the way the government functions. They should not be implemented in any government program. There should be no bias shown. They shouldn't have tax-free status. There should be no special treatment for religions by governments. You can do whatever you want to do as long as it doesn't violate human rights but you're not going to get exceptions, you're not going to get help from the government in order to do it. Without the need to desperately streamline the economy, a 2% growth rate could mean that all that extra money that would go into creating a larger growth rate can instead go to development of healthcare. It could go to the education of the people. It could go to all of these things. You could suddenly free up trillions of dollars that go to driving economies to be the most efficient, most streamlined they can be to compete with other countries. And you could accept a slower growth rate in order to create universal health care, universal education, universal welfare, all of these situ all these programs that you need to be able to help people to be what they want to be or get where they want to go. The only reason we don't do that is because we are afraid that we are going to fall behind on other countries and investors are going to go elsewhere. Economies are going to you know, split up and go to other places where they could be making more money than they are at home. That's not a risk in a singular state. You can make the best decision and accept a slower growth rate, but it will still be the best decision. 
We want to stop history from repeating itself and we want to go forward into the future by connecting as a species and acknowledging the civilization of mankind for what it is, we can do this. By letting go of our convoluted and largely manufactured national identities that are usually based on willful, willful historical ignorance, we can do this. By deciding to embrace the only real, the only objectively real identity that we have, that we are human beings, we can do this. By choosing to make a universal democratic system, we can do this. By choosing to create the Unitary Republic, we can do this. We want to create the Unitary Republic. Then create a party. Or join the one that already exists in your nation. Take up the torch and decide to act on your own volition if you have to. Talk about it, write about it, lift it from the page, take it from the internet and make it real. Bring it offline and bring it into the real world. Do it on your own behalf as I will continue to do on mine. Every one of us holds the fate of the entire world in our hands. Your action or inaction can make the final decision on this. So I implore you, I implore you to do everything you can to make this a reality, to make this actually begin and start to happen. Come forward. Visit the WordPress site, acknowledge your party membership, you'll find the link in the description. Then soon, with enough support, you might be voting for the Unitary Republic on your own ballot, wherever you live in the world. Once we are in government, we can start to finally create the future that we want to see. Until then, it is just a dream. But I know that I want my grandchildren to be focused on solving the mysteries of the universe. Solving the mysteries of everything around us. Not worrying what another country may or may not be planning against them. What about you?